Hello, everyone, and welcome to our monthly webinar, Season Speaks, a virtual series. Thank you for joining us today for this month's topic, Medical Cannabis and Pain Management 101. I'm Amanda White, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications for Seasons Retirement Communities. For background, Seasons is a Canadian retirement home operator that was established in 2009. We operate 22 retirement communities in Ontario and Alberta. We have proudly created a culture that is dedicated to providing residents with superior customer service. We want our residents to be proud to call us home and to know that they're surrounded by people who genuinely care. Today, I'm joined by Debbie Santos, our presenter for our webinar topic, Medical Cannabis and Pain Management 101. Debbie is Vice President of Quality and Clinical Experience at CareRx Pharmacy. She is a licensed pharmacist in British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario with over 30 years of clinical experience in long-term care, retirement homes, assisted living, and group homes. She provides expertise in managing medication therapy for individuals with complex or unique needs and oversees the design, development, and delivery of quality and clinical programs. Debbie provides leadership to the clinical pharmacists in a variety of healthcare settings and supports the delivery of programs to ensure safe, effective medication use and improved patient wellness. Debbie is passionate about healthcare and actively participates in organizations that promote improved healthcare and quality of life. As a fun fact, Debbie was also the medical services director for the 2009 Canadian Olympic curling trials, responsible for all aspects of medical services required by the elite athletes. We're lucky to have her with us today to discuss this exciting topic. And now Debbie will walk you through today's agenda before we get started. Debbie? Thank you, Amanda. And thank you everybody for joining today. I mean, for me, med cannabis is one of my favorite topics and I'm really excited today to present uh, to you on med cannabis. And I think what, I, what I'm gonna try to cover today is some of the more common questions that I get asked. Uh, about med cannabis and hopefully that's going to answer some of the questions that you have so we're going to cover off um, you know just what is med cannabis and then we'll take a look at how does how does it work i often get asked that question like you know how, how can you take cannabis oil and it's going to help your pain etc then we'll look at the main components uh, of med cannabis and then uh, talk about some of the therapeutic benefits about it. And then of course, with that, um, you know, who should not take uh, med cannabis. And then lastly, at the end of the presentation, I wanna cover off uh, adverse uh, effects of med cannabis. So next, uh, I just wanna talk before I get into the presentation, um, I wanna talk about um, some of that. I don't have any financial sponsors or direct financial relationships with any medical cannabis companies. So wanted to uh, put that disclosure out there. And just mention that this is an educational presentation. So it's really not intended, uh, you know, medical cannabis being just like any other medication. You want to seek the advice of your uh, physician, your clinical pharmacist, anybody that's familiar with your specific medical history and your medical conditions. Okay, so next we're going to talk about uh, what is medical cannabis. Um, let's get started then. I wanted to take just a quick uh, overview or, or glance at the legislation. Um, the Cannabis Act and the Cannabis Regulations, that's what governs uh, cannabis use today. And uh, it did come into uh, force in 2018. And so when that happened, what it did was it legalized, you know, now you can possess med cannabis and you can sell um, med cannabis. But it also brought into legalization the recreational uh, side of things. So uh, we do have two systems in Canada. One system is the non-medical, or that's the recreational side. And then the other system is the medical uh, purposes side. And, and for our presentation today, I'm going to focus on the medical cannabis side of things. All right, so let's start with the medical cannabis plant itself. What that plant does is it, it contains a lot of chemically active uh, components or compounds, and these are called cannabinoids. And we know that there's over 100 cannabinoids right now that are found uh, in the, the head of the cannabis plant. The two main ones, I mean, we can't talk about 100 cannabinoids on this call. We're going to talk about the two main ones, and those uh, are chemically active compounds. They're called THC and CBD. And you're kind of going to want to remember those because um, most of the products, everything that you see will be labeled with the THC and the CBD uh, content. 
So I'm sure, or maybe I'm not sure, uh, I guess I shouldn't assume that all of you have seen uh, a cannabis plant before, but if you haven't, I've got an image uh, of that on the right hand side uh, of the slide there. And the plant itself has four parts. It's got, you know, the flowers, the buds, the leaves and, and the stem. So the flowers, those are what's produced, like in this case, only by the female plant. And it contains both the THC and CBD. And then uh, when those flowers are kind of, you know, they, they cut them down during harvesting and prep time and they produce these buds and, and what the buds do, um, and we'll talk about that uh, as well, but they're also uh, high, of course, because they're part of the flowers in THC and CBD. The leaves, however, they, they have some psychoactive and pharmacological properties, but not near as much as you would see uh, with the flowers. And then the last part of the plant is the stem. And, and that's what, you know, all plants have. That, that's what holds uh, the cannabis plant up. It's got strong fibers and they use that part of the, you know, the stem or that part of the plant to make hemp. I, I'm sure you've heard of hemp or hemp oil. You've seen hemp products uh, on the market. The hemp oil though is not as potent as the cannabis oil. Now this um, slide, I tried to capture a close up of the, the cannabis plant and you can see the tiny white nodules there. They're, um, they're called trichomes, uh, resin glands is another name you'll, you'll sometimes hear. And those are concentrated sources of cannabinoids. So within the trichomes, you've got concentrated sources of THC and CBD, which we know is the active component of medical cannabis. The other component in the plants are terpenes. And, and what terpenes do is they give it that smell and that taste, that smell that you, you know well from med cannabis. Uh, and then, well, maybe think about a lavender plant, for instance. It's got the terpenes and essential oils that give lavender that smell, just as the cannabis plant has terpenes uh, in it as well. And then flavonoids are another component. That's what sort of gives it its color. Uh, each of the different plants have distinct colors and, and distinct uh, flavonoids. Um, but the last point there I want to talk about is strains. And, you know, what is a strain, you know? But so what, what I, the, sort of the best way I can describe what a strain is, is it's unique to every, uh, like every cannabis plant uh, is unique. It has its own percentage, you know, a certain percentage of THC, a certain percentage of, of CBD. It has its own terp its own flavonoids. So this, these are, uh, that's sort of how a strain uh, is defined. And there's a wide variance between the different strains uh, in terms of how much THC or CBD. So um, what I want to do now is provide uh, a quick summary of the cannabis plant itself, and then we'll get into uh, some of the other parts of the presentation. So uh, here on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see um, if, if you imagine that as, a, as the cannabis plant itself, and now we know there's 200 different combinations or strains uh, of plants and that each plant has their own cannabinoid and non-cannabinoid uh, components. So we talked about that, the two most common cannabinoid being the THC and the CBD, and then the non-cannabinoid being the, you, you know, the terpenes and the flavonoids. So if you take all of that in, in combination, um, that's what's responsible for how it acts in your body, the bioactivity within uh, your body. And that's often referred to as what they call the entourage effect. Let's look at how med cannabis works uh, in your body. So when you use med cannabis, what you're doing is, you know, you're introducing these cannabinoids into your system and they bind to receptors uh, within your body. So here you can see uh, the receptor uh, body in the system. It's called the endocannabinoid system. And it's, it's a pretty complicated system. It's responsible for a lot of the physiological activities that take place within our body. The main receptors there, you can see on the right-hand side, the CB1 and 2 receptors. And then that diagram, although I apologize, it's, it's kind of small, but you can see the distribution of the receptors. So there's a wide distribution of these uh, receptors uh, within our body. And, and all of that is called the endocannabinoid system. You know, we've got our central nervous system. This is called our endocannabinoid system. So these cannabinoids that we, we take through med cannabis, or we, you'll find out in a minute, we do have them uh, occurring naturally in our, our body. They act directly on this endocannabinoid uh, system and they bind to the receptors. So, um, you know, looking at the CB1 receptor, 
it's involved in a lot of the regulatory functions uh, within our body. It maintains, uh, you know, like temperature, uh, appetite uh, suppression or uh, metabolism. It, it regulates your weight and your sleep cycles. It's involved in sensitivity to pain, uh, motor control, cognition, uh, memory, and, and even emotional responses. So it's involved all those regulatory, even regulating your mood. So those are the CB1 receptors. The CB2 receptors, a little bit easier. It's uh, found in your immune system and it plays a, a big role in uh, the inflammatory response. So now that we know about the cannabinoids, let's talk about the different classes of cannabinoids. So your endocannabinoids, these ones I, I think I just mentioned are already in your body. They're found in your body. They're naturally produced there. Um, so your phytocannabinoids though, those you have to somehow introduce into your body. You know, if you're going to be smoking uh, cannabis, you're going to be taking it orally. They're introduced into your body somehow. And, and the word phyto means plant. So these are from the cannabis plant. They're organic uh, cannabinoids. And then the last class is the prescription cannabinoids. And they're available only on prescription. Um, they're produced by drug manufacturers. And I, I think what I'll do is I, I'm going to talk about uh, two there's two on the market, and, and I'm going to just do a quick overview of the prescription cannabinoids for you, and then we're going to go into detail, spend the rest of the time, of course, on the phytocannabinoids, which is the medical cannabis. So this is the first prescription cannabinoid. Uh, it's called Nabilone. Uh, it's brand name Sesamet. It's an oral capsule. It comes in three concentrations, kind of a disadvantage in that it only contains THC. But, um, and, and so it, it, it is synthetic, uh, you know, it's manufactured synthetically. So it mimics uh, the, the natural uh, THC component. And so it has side effects similar to THC, et cetera. And it's used off label to treat uh, nausea and vomit. Sorry, it's used off label to treat pain and it's used indicated on label uh, for the nausea and vomiting, so vomiting associated with uh, chemotherapy. Very effective for that. Uh, we dispense a lot of uh, nabilone for uh, nausea associated with uh, chemotherapy, and we're seeing it used more and more off-label uh, by physicians uh, for pain. Now, the next prescription uh, cannabinoid is nabiximols. And uh, this one uh, is, in, is available uh, in Canada under the brand name called Sativex. It is an extract from the herbal cannabis plant. It's an oil extract. Put, and you can see that it's a spray uh, there. So it's oil in, in a spray uh, delivery. And what you do is you spray uh, either under the tongue or the sides of the cheek. And it acts quite uh, quickly. It's usually within uh, 30 minutes. Uh, it's indicated for uh, the relief of spasticity or uh, neuropathic pain in adults for MS. So it's really indicated uh, for uh, MS patients, but it's also indicated for patients where, uh, you know, they have cancer, they're using opioids and they want something else to help them. So it's also indicated for that. Okay, so now let's look, you know, I, I talked about THC and CBD. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail. So THC. Um, and CBD, those are the two main uh, cannabinoids, uh, as I mentioned, that are found in the cannabis plant. Um, and of course, different strains have different percentages of THC and CBD. Now, when you talk about THC specifically, it's, and, and when you hear side effects from medical cannabis, most of that's coming from the THC side. Um, so, you know, if you are getting side effects, then, then you're going to want to reduce the uh, amount of THC. Uh, in the product that you're using. So in, in terms of THC itself, it's responsible for um, that sort of high or euphoria that you hear uh, with med cannabis or with you know, recreational cannabis for that matter. And it is found to be effective in controlling pain for that nausea, for muscle spasms and for stimulating uh, appetite. It's used um, for uh, a lot of, uh, we see it being used in trials with uh, HIV patients for stimulating uh, appetite. Um, and then when you look at the CBD side, it's the non-psychoactive component. So if you're taking just plain CBD oil, you're not, have, you're not getting that uh, euphoric effect. In fact, we, it, we think that uh, the CBD sort of antagonizes the high uh, of the THC. So quite often 
And that's why you see um, CBD THC combinations because you know, depending on the condition you're treating, you may want that combination. So when um, on the CBD side, it is effective at anti-inflammatory properties, analgesic for pain, anti-nausea and anti-anxiety and, and anti-epileptic uh, in especially uh, on the pediatric side on the epilepsy piece there. So if you think about it, um, you know, you've got THC and CBD, you're using it, let's say to reduce pain. Now it's helping with pain, you're sleeping through the night. And uh, now you've got that added benefit. If you're sleeping through the night, then, it, then you know, it's improving your sleep. And then it's also, um, you know, if you get a good night's sleep, it, it's improving your mood the next morning. So we sort of see that trickle effect. Now, uh, I think like with the THC and CBD, it's really important to look at the ratio. And, and you can see on the right-hand side, we've got the um, THC effects and the CBD effects, and then you've got those sort of shared effects. So depending on the ratio, like if you're only using a THC product, then you know, you're gonna get that muscle relaxant uh, appetite stimulation effect. If you're using a combination, then you're gonna see some of those shared effects. So when you're looking at the ratio, it's important to consider, you know, um, depending the, on what ratio you, you use, like low, high CBD, low THC to treat pain, for instance, um, you know, these are the kind of, um, of things that the physicians look at when they're uh, looking at the type of product selection uh, for you. They'll usually start with CBD and then slowly uh, add THC if it's, if it's required. Now, licensed producers, they have to specify the percent of THC and CBD in their products. And we generally see um, physicians using higher CBD products, especially in the elderly, with a lower THC uh, combination. But as a general uh, guideline, you should start really low and then go slow. So, you know, start with a low concentration of CBD, slowly increase it. And sometimes you have to use different strains because, um, the, you know, there's different uh, combinations. So if one strain doesn't work quite often, uh, you'll, you know, you'll try a different uh, strain. But the goal is really to find the dose that's most effective and then the least number of side effects, of course. So um, speaking of um, side effects and, and indications and, and contraindications, I guess, let's look at the therapeutic uh, benefits of med cannabis, and then um, we'll take a quick look at who should not take um, med cannabis. Like, you know, where is it contraindicated? Okay, so if you ask me, you know, Deb, what, you know, what form of med cannabis should I, I be using? As a healthcare professional, we don't recommend smoking or vaping, just like I, I don't recommend um, you know, tobacco. So the preferred uh, product delivery is to take it orally. I thought I'll give you, you know, a little bit of background on oral consumption. We know that uh, smoking and vaping, you, the, the onset is very quick from anywhere from zero to you know, 15 minutes uh, orally. The onset uh, takes a little bit longer. It's one to three hours. But the reason we like oral is, you know, many things. It's um, much safer than, than smoking medical cannabis. And you get a consistent standardized dose that way. So like when you think about taking um, any product orally, um, med cannabis included, um, you know, you're taking the capsules. They're absorbed in your GI tract. Then they're going to, you know, once they pass there, they're going to be metabolized uh, in your liver. And then from your liver, they're going to enter the bloodstream. And then once they're in the bloodstream, that's when you get that, you know, desired uh, therapeutic effect. So, um, you know, whether that's going to be managing pain or managing insomnia. So all of this takes time. And that's why the oral dosing, it does have a slower onset. Uh, I agree, but it does uh, and you won't see immediate effect, but it does have the advantage of a longer duration, which is great if you're using it for pain, you know, especially overnight. Um, the duration is six to eight hours. So, you know, you're going to get overnight pain relief, or if you're taking it during the day, then you're not going to have to dose uh, until later, uh, you know, within uh, six to eight hours, because you get that long-term uh, effect from there. The one thing though is, um, you should never, you know, if, if you take the med cannabis and then you're thinking, well, I'm not seeing any effect and it's been an hour, you shouldn't repeat the dose because remember, then you're going to have, it's almost like double dosing because you're going to have that 
added effect um, because it does take one to three hours. Okay. This table, I mean, it looks like a complicated table, but I put it here because I think it's uh, really important. Um, as a pharmacist, healthcare professional, I always want to see the evidence, you know, and I always look to my uh, college bodies, you know, uh, nurses are looking to the College of Nurses, I'm looking to the College of Pharmacists, to Health Canada for guidelines around medical cannabis, like what can it be used for? So that's why I think this is important. The National Academies of Science, they published an extensive review. And what they did was they assessed all the current evidence. They looked at benefits and risks of using med cannabis. They assessed all the current evidence. They summarized it uh, in this. And this is just one uh, portion, of course, of that published uh, review. But this table summarizes the levels of evidence uh, in, in terms of like for use. So there's three categories where they say, yes, conclusively, there's conclusive or substantial evidence to say that it works for these following conditions, or there's moderate, that's the middle column, or there's very limited evidence that it works uh, in these conditions, but it has been trialed. So uh, let's quickly review uh, that evidence in the next few slides. Okay, so this particular, um, the Canadian Pharmacists Association is who I look to uh, for guidance. Um, they, they produced what they call a, a Cannabis for Medical Purposes Evidence Guide. And I've kind of put just a, a snip of the front page there uh, for you. But the reason I included it was, um, you know, they're giving us these guidelines. And the good news is that they also included those evidence levels from like they're recognizing those evidence levels from the National Academy of Science. So in terms of looking at that first column or the conclusive or substantial evidence for effectiveness, we know that with, there's lots of evidence out there that uh, it is effective in the treatment of chronic neuropathic pain in adults. Uh, in fact, the Canadian Pain Society, um, they recommending, recommend using cannabinoids as the third line for chronic neuropathic pain. So in other words, they're saying, you know, first line is trying things like gabapentin and some of the antidepressants. If that doesn't work, then you'll move on to the opioids or tramadol. And if that third line, then is, uh, if that doesn't work, then you'll move on to the medical cannabis. Now I have heard, but uh, you know, I don't know if that will happen, that med cannabis will move up to be second and they want you to try it before uh, opioids. Um, this is what we're hearing uh, in the industry, but you know, I haven't uh, seen that yet. Um, the other conclusive or substantial evidence on you know, med cannabis be, being effective is for uh, chemotherapy. Uh, induced nausea and vomiting uh, and improved MS spasticity or in spinal cord injuries. Uh, we're seeing, you know, if there's spasticity involved in that, we know that it causes, it, it, there is muscle relaxation. So there's evidence for that. And then the last one is uh, with pediatric, uh, not applicable in our population, but um, lots of um, evidence coming out on uh, pediatric seizures where they've tried everything um, and nothing seems to be working and they've moved to medical cannabis and it seems to help reduce the seizures in some of the young uh, children. Now, another guideline, this is, uh, I promise the last guideline I'm gonna show you, but this one here is from Health Canada and it is an information for healthcare professionals specific to cannabis and, um, and cannabinoids. And, what they did was they, you know, and I just kind of included their, their quote here, but they're saying that there's more consistent evidence uh, of the effectiveness in using cannabis in treating chronic pain um, of various causes. So, um, you know, we're starting to see more and more evidence of effective pain reduction uh, with the use of medical cannabis. Now, this last um, column, if you remember on the table, was the limited evidence. So there is limited evidence. And you know what? It's limited. And, and I keep seeing more and more evidence coming out. There's lots of trials uh, in Europe, uh, in Canada, in the US that are, they're, that are coming out uh, on many of the different conditions and medical cannabis being used to uh, you know, treat these. But uh, for opioid sparing, for those of you who aren't uh, aware of what that is, is during some of the pain trials, what they're seeing is um, like the opioids, you know, working on their, the way that they kill pain 
and then med cannabis, it's sort of a synergistic effect. So um, when uh, the person is using an opioid and then put on med cannabis, they're finding that they can start reducing that opioid, which is really good because then, you know, you're helping out with those side effects that are really bothersome, the, the, um, the dizziness, the drowsiness, the, but mostly that constipation uh, piece. And, um, and of course, um, with, as you reduce those opioids, that what they call that is opioid sparing. So I've seen trials where they put um, individuals trialed med cannabis and we've seen an 18% um, decrease or, or uh, discontinuation of opioids. So lots of good evidence coming out on that. And then, um, but uh, limited evidence around anxiety. Um, there is evidence around um, using med cannabis for uh, agitation that's associated uh, with dementia. And the other thing we're starting to see evidence on now is with Parkinson's disease. So there's limited evidence, but they are doing uh, trials that there is possible reduction in uh, Parkinson related tremors uh, now. So um, I guess we stay tuned for that piece. Okay, so, you know, in summary, the THC and the CBD, there's emerging evidence that med medical cannabis can be used, you see on the THC side, as an appetite suppressant and to reduce uh, insomnia. We know we saw conclusive evidence that it could be used effectively uh, for chronic pain uh, as an anti-nausea agent, um, you know, muscle uh, used to decrease muscle spasms. And then uh, we're seeing it now trialed for seizures and uh, Lastly, um, coming out with some emerging uh, evidence on its use, uh, more evidence on uh, anxiety and inflammation. So those are the indications and the evidence around it. So what about contraindications? We know med cannabis is not for everybody. So let's take a look and see uh, who cannot take med cannabis. So um, many situations um, where you, um, have to use med cannabis it's either contraindicated in other words you're not going to use it or it can be used cautiously and under the supervision uh, of a physician so um, under the age of 25 that is because of the like the brain is still growing and brain health it has to do with that um, so let's uh, look at some of the ones that are, are you know sort of more relevant uh, to our use and that is unstable cardiovascular conditions so that for sure uh, is a contraindication if uh, if the condition is unstable. So in other words, uh, arrhythmias, uh, angina, um, ischemic heart disease, uh, increased heart rate, uh, those kind of things, really important um, to check with your physician before you use med cannabis if you have any of those conditions. The other one is uh, uncontrolled, uh, high, like high blood pressure, hypertension, or even low blood pressure. If it's not controlled, then you want to um, speak uh, to the physician and, and uh, they may use that uh, with caution. The respiratory uh, precaution or contraindication is more for uh, anyone who has asthma or COPD and you were smoking uh, med cannabis. So not really relevant uh, to uh, if you're taking oral uh, soft gels or capsules or, or the cannabis oil. Um, severe liver disease uh, is a contraindication. So um, one of the things with med cannabis is they're seeing it is a predictor for uh, fatty liver. So anyone with hep C or any liver disease, then it would be a contraindication uh, at that time. And, and of course, the very last point, uh, if you're allergic to med cannabis uh, in any way, then uh, you shouldn't uh, take it. That would be a contraindication. Okay, so let's move, you know, those were kind of some of the physical uh, contraindications. Let's move from that to um, uh, mental health history uh, precautions where med cannabis is, e it's either contraindicated or again, used with caution under the uh, supervision uh, of a, a physician. Uh, contraindications would include unstable, um, you know, mental health conditions, anyone with an elevated risk uh, towards uh, addiction, um, those kind of individuals are not likely uh, good candidates for med cannabis. Uh, anyone with a personal history or a strong history of psychosis, um, it could uh, possibly exacerbate, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar. So that would be um, under only under the, uh, you know, supervision uh, of a physician. 
And then the last one, med cannabis disorder, that is where, you know, you've got that addiction, just like uh, alcohol uh, use uh, disorder, where you've got this strong desire to take med cannabis or, or to drink uh, the alcohol. Those are often, um, those are uh, usually not good candidates for medical cannabis. Okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about and is medical cannabis in terms of adverse effects or side effects. Um, we often get a lot of questions uh, on this particular topic. So I broke down uh, the effects into uh, short-term side effects and then sort of the long-term um, side effects. We're just uh, getting more and more uh, data on that. So let's look at the short-term side effects first. Generally, most of these side effects, um, I had mentioned that uh, earlier, is from products that are high in THC. So uh, what I did was I kind of put in, uh, in the black font there, uh, so it stood out. Those are the more common side effects uh, that we see, you know, sedation, drowsiness, dizziness, dry mouth, um, euphoria, of course, that's a side effect. If, if the strain has high THC content, you're going to see more um, more side effects. So if you do experience one of the side effects, then, you know, you want to consider switching to a, a lower THC product, um, higher CBD product. Um, and remember, it's known that CBD can kind of counter those uh, effects uh, of the THC. But I, I, I would caution again, um, you know, that we're talking about side effects, but I, I would caution again, um, you know, with the cardiovascular side, uh, increased uh, heart rate, uh, things like that, we do recommend um, making sure that uh, you see a physician and get their, their guidance in terms of uh, taking med cannabis uh, if you've got cardiovascular uh, challenges. So if you do experience uh, you know, any of these side effects, then uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to switch to a higher CBD product and you know, sort of cut out some of that uh, THC. I think most of us would be on CBD uh, products uh, initially with very low THC uh, for pain. That's what we see the physicians uh, using. So long-term side effects. Um, here, you know, this is with long-term uh, use. Uh, people ask about, you know, tolerance and, and dependence. Uh, it does exist, but it is very low. Like when you look at uh, addiction for cannabis versus uh, alcohol or tobacco, Cannabis is about 9% compared to alcohol, which is almost double that, and then tobacco, which is at 32%, so almost four times greater risk of addiction and tolerance, et cetera, with tobacco, um, where cannabis sits at about uh, 9%. The other long-term effect is, comes from the smoking end of um, a medical cannabis. That's the chronic cough, chronic cough and wheezing. Uh, we, we see that uh, with long-term use. Uh, but only uh, from the, those individuals who smoke med cannabis. And then when you start med cannabis, I, I think it's really important. Uh, if you're starting it, you're going to monitor the effects uh, and you're going to monitor the side effects because um, you, you slowly want to increase the dosage. And we don't have enough time today to talk about dosing. But if you're starting on CBD, you're slowly going to increase that dosage. And then at some point, um, you may or may not, the physician may or may not add THC uh, to your, your product, but you're going to start low and go slow. And so if you're monitoring it, you're going to see at what stage you're starting to see any side effects, if you are starting to see side effects. Okay, so this takes me uh, sort of to the end of the presentation. Um, one of the things, you know, being a pharmacist, uh, I have to have a picture of a pharmacist here uh, on the slide and uh, just know that your clinical pharmacist, your physician, the nursing staff, uh, everybody plays an important role in your healthcare. So um, med cannabis isn't a one size fits all. Uh, you know, we heard about uh, 200 strains, 100 different cannabinoids. You heard about the terpenes, flavonoids, all those things, they all play a role in the um, in how med cannabis acts, you know, in your body. And so, um, it, like I say, it isn't a one size all fits therapy and the dosing uh, really needs to start low and then taper uh, slowly uh, upwards. So remember, it does take time uh, to see results. You know, if you take a prescription uh, 
opioid and, and you're going to get, uh, you know, pain relief uh, right away. And then over time, you know, you often have to increase the, the uh, opioid uh, dosing. It's just with med cannabis, it, it's going to be a slower, you're going to see a slower effect. The results aren't going to be as quick as you would find with some uh, prescription uh, medications, but really do encourage you reach out to your uh, healthcare professional, your pharmacist. Um, our pharmacists uh, are all knowledgeable. Um, and just like any pharmacist, they're, they're knowledgeable in, in medical cannabis and they'll work with you uh, and your physician to see if it's, you know, an appropriate uh, choice or option uh, for you for the specific uh, ailment that you're trying to treat, be it pain or, or insomnia or, you know, some kind of uh, inflammatory, etc. So uh, that's the end of the presentation at this time, and I'll uh, pass it over. That's great. Thanks so much, Debbie, for sharing your knowledge of medical cannabis to help us better understand what it is, how it works, what it can be used for, and who should not use it. As Debbie mentioned, if you're interested in seeing if medical cannabis is the right treatment for you, please reach out to your healthcare professional, and they will work with you to see if it's the right next step. We hope today's presentation provided you with essential knowledge and insight to better understand medical cannabis. This next part of the session will be a live Q&A period. Okay, so looking at our Q&A, uh, the first question, Debbie, is do I need a prescription for medical cannabis? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. So um, in terms of prescriptions, when you go to a physician, um, you know, for a particular ailment, you're having pain, you want to go to the physician and see if they can help you, they'll do an assessment, uh, write a prescription uh, for you if it's, if it's appropriate. Same thing happens with med cannabis, you have to still go through that um, uh, referral process, you need to see a physician for uh, an assessment. And then if they feel it's appropriate, they write what's called it's not a prescription, because with a prescription, you're taking it to your pharmacy to get filled. But what they do is they fill out what's called a medical document. And then that medical document is faxed off to it's via a secure portal, but it goes to a licensed uh, producer. Great. Thanks, Debbie. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is actually, which um, follows that first question nicely. How long does a medical cannabis authorization last? Oh, good question. Uh, it lasts, well, really, it depends how long your physician writes the order for. So they can write it for 30 days. The maximum length of time that this um, order, I, I like to call it an order versus uh, prescription, the order or medical document uh, can be authorized for is one year. So that's one of the things that you do need to keep uh, track of is that expiry date on your uh, order or your medical document. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned licensed producer. What is that? Okay, um, that's a really good question. A licensed producer is somebody who they're licensed by Health Canada. And what they can do is they, um, they can sell um, medical cannabis and um, they, I guess they have strict regulations, uh, strict specifications around um, producing med cannabis labeling it, packaging it, shipping it. They've got all kinds of uh, regulations, just as a drug manufacturer would have. The licensed producers have that, but they hold that license, you know, so they have to apply to Health Canada for that license. So anytime you're ordering medical cannabis, uh, you're ordering that uh, direct from a licensed producer. And they also have to follow confidentiality guidelines. So lots of regulations for them. Good okay, question. that's great. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Thanks so much. So. Um, with that, then, we're going to conclude today's session. Thank you for joining us for this month's Season Speaks, a virtual series. And a big thank you to Debbie from seasonsretirement.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Be sure to click like or follow to get the latest updates for our next Season Speaks webinar in September. We hope to connect with you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Amanda. Bye, everyone.